Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Father Kevin Wilds, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our, our President's Forum this evening, Oil and Water Spotlight on the Gulf. The President's Forum series was established several years ago to enable us to examine important issues impacting our culture and our society in, in however, in a way that was uh, intellectual and gave a good analysis of the issue. This series is an extension of our mission to teach our students to think critically and act justly. And the forums try to bring together experts to allow us to witness an elevated discourse on urgent issues in our time. While it has been more than a year has passed since the Deepwater Horizon rig exploded, killing 11 people and triggering a massive oil spill in the Gulf, its impact remains an urgent issue for us today. The oil spill exacerbated some of the most serious concerns that face the Gulf Coast, wetland deterioration, hurricane vulnerability, and economic dependence on an industry that is often responsible for serious environmental damage. Many of the spill's long-term effects, the health of the Gulf Coast residents and wildlife and the Gulf-based Gulf seafood industry remain unknown. And looming over all of these issues are the other issues about climate change and the way it can impact the way we live. Tonight, we have a panel of experts to discuss how climate change and the BP Deepwater Horizon oil explosion continue to affect the Gulf Coast and our residents. This evening, we have Dr. Virginia Burkett of the U.S. Geological Survey, Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter Amy Harmon of the New York Times, and Cynthia Sartu of the Gulf Restoration Network, and our own Dr. Bob Thomas, the director of the Center for Environmental Communication, will moderate our discussion. Let me just do a little background on each of our panelists this evening. Uh, Dr. Burkett is internationally recognized as a leader in research on the impacts of climate change. She is currently the chief scientist for global change research for the G U.S. Geological Survey. She was the lead author for the uh, sections of the United Nations International Planet and Climate Change P Report, for which her team and Al Gore received the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. She was, has an intimate knowledge of the Gulf Coast ecosystem, serving as Assistant Director of the Louisiana Geological Survey, Director of Louisiana's Coastal Zone Management Program, and Director and Secretary for Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Amy Harmon is a national correspondent for the New York Times, who is covering the impact of science and technology on American life. She recently provided extensive reporting on the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. She has also examined every aspect, almost every aspect of the oil spill, from its damaging effects on the environment to the plight of the fishermen and nearly, and that have nearly been driven into bankruptcy and the seafood industry, which struggles to recover. Harmon joined the New York Times in 1997 and in 2008 won a Pulitzer Prize for her series, The DNA Age. Cynthia Sartu is the executive director of the Gulf Coast Restoration Network, where she leads fundraising efforts and works to elevate regional issues to a national level. And her, she monitors federal agency actions that are affecting areas of the Gulf Coast and the Gulf states. In October 2010, she and other parties filed a lawsuit against the Environmental Protection Agency in response to the use of possibly topic uh, dispersants in cleaning up the oil slick. She is also fighting congressional attempts to slash bu budgets that would cut funding for clean water and th their programs, national parks, and clean energy programs. And of course, our moderator this evening is Dr. Robert A. Thomas, who is the director of Loyola's Center for Environmental Communications. He is the founding director of the Louisiana Nature Center and has served as a community liaison for information pertaining to science education, environmental issues, and natural history. Since the BP oil spill in 2010, Bob has been featured as an environmental expert in hundreds of news reports and, is, and has become a member of the Louisiana Office of Tourism's Expert Bureau. And he is also a past president of the Association of Nature, 
Nature Center and Administration, and he is the past chair of the Environmental Advisory Committee for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And so it is my pleasure this evening to turn it over to Bob Thomas, who will guide us through this evening. And thank you and welcome. Thank you, Father Wiles. And welcome to the President's Symposium that's hosted and has been put together by the Loyola Center for the Study of New Orleans. I thought we'd start tonight with a few facts that we should never forget. First, as Father mentioned, 11 lives were lost, and those families will never be made whole. Untold numbers of people along the coast have had their lives altered immeasurably. We'll hear about that some tonight. One of the least studied areas of concern is the chronic impact on human health, uh, being discussed frequently now, unfortunately, with very little data. 206 million gallons of crude oil gushed into our coastal waters. 1.8 million gallons of dispersant were placed in our coastal waters. The gusher happened on top of one of only two known spawning beds for the bluefin tuna, and at the moment of their spawn. Many bottlenose dolphins and sea turtles have washed ashore, and to date we have no data to indicate the cause. No thorough autopsies have occurred. We don't know how much of the 206 million gallons of oil are still present in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a lot of speculation. Years may pass before we know if the Gulf ecosystem has been harmed, how the life cycles of marine organisms have been affected, if any components of the fishery have been altered. We estimate that five square miles of coastal marsh have been destroyed by heavy oiling. And we have no idea of the long or short term impacts, nor the amount of oil that has seeped beneath the surface. And to repeat, 11 lives were lost. I was asked a couple of days ago, uh, talking to a friend of mine who runs a nonprofit organization and discussing doing interviews and how frustrating it is to, to have to keep saying we don't know. And uh, one of the issues was that she raised the issue of, she says, I just can't imagine how scientists will say things like the catastrophe we imagined has not occurred. And then in their interviews say, we don't know about what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, the reality is that that's the kind of thing we'd like for you to, to ask about tonight. And maybe our speakers will address that as well. Uh, the issue is that we all thought, I don't know about you, but I thought, <laughs> I'm not going to speak for the crowd, but I thought that we would see two feet of crude oil coming in a couple of miles into, into the, uh, the marsh as a worst case scenario. And that would have been horrible. Uh, that didn't happen. But you can't say that a catastrophe has not occurred yet. You must be patient. You must know that it's going to take time for science to tell us what's really happening out there. So how do we plan for the future knowing that a similar uh, accident could happen again? What policies must be put in place to protect our beloved coastal ecosystem and our economic and cultural futures? How do we strengthen our economy? How do we mend broken lives and broken hearts? We know that Louisiana's economy has evolved with reliance on shipping, fishing, and the petrochemical industry. We know that this very unfortunate catastrophe has impaired the lives of the many who love our coast and culture. Tonight, we'll explore three aspects of the health of the Gulf of Mexico. One is the impact of global climate change on the possible future of the Gulf. Two would be concerns for the future of the Gulf ecosystem voiced by a locally based advocacy organization, the Gulf Restoration Network. And then third, the impact of the oil gusher on local citizens whose lives are completely interwoven with a healthy ecosystem as told by a journalist who covered those impacts. So without further ado, I introduce Dr. Virginia Burkett. Thank you, Bob, and thank you all for a beautiful crowd tonight, and uh, it's just a pleasure to be here. I've been asked to talk about one stressor that is going to have an impact on our coast, is already having an impact on the coast of Louisiana. Uh, I live in Louisiana, actually, even though I report to our headquarters in Washington. Um, we talk about climate change and uh, talk about the trends and future projections 
global and then focusing down on the Gulf Coast region, implications for ecosystems, and then finally some things that, that might be done to mitigate and adapt to uh, the effects. You know, just for those of you that are familiar with the geologic record, the climate's been changing throughout the paleo history of the Earth. And this is a 450,000 year scale record here. This is the present time. And you can see that as the CO2 level has increased in the past, kind of regularly, about 100,000 years it looks like, you see that the temperature tracks it. And there are powerful feedbacks so that as the temperature increases, uh, the CO2 level arises even faster. And so it's kind of like chicken and the egg, it looks like in some cases. But generally, uh, you see these, these nice trends, these oscillations that are natural, of course, in the Earth's climate history. We know that these are exact records of the Earth's paleo history through the collection of ice cores. At USGS, we have the National Ice Core Lab, and we collect cores from uh, both ends of the uh, planet, and we preserve them in a constant temperature and pressure, bring them back to the lab, analyze the, uh, the, the isotopes of the water, the oxygen and the hydrogen, and it basically can determine what the temperature was when the ice was laid down. And we pull out the ice, um, the, the air bubbles that are trapped in the ice, and we know with high, high confidence that these are the levels of temperature and CO2 in the past. And today, that's where we are. And so it happened very rapidly over a period of about 150 years. And um, uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that. The reason most scientists believe that we've got these large swings in this atmospheric CO2 and uh, temperature is because the Earth's orbit goes from perfectly circular, almost perfectly circular orbit around the sun to an elliptical orbit in which the sun is, is offset and it gets less radiative forcing in this part of the cycle. This cycle is about a 90 to 100,000 years and most scientists agree over the past million years. That's why we had those swings, those nice beautiful swings in the Earth's temperature. And uh, in the past, you saw a lot of other little blips. The obliquity cycle, a cycle of about 40,000 years, where one end of the planet will warm more than the other. The other end will get cooler as it tilts towards the sun. Just a natural change in the, the rotation of the Earth around its axis. And then we have the precession cycle. If any of you are pilots, you have an old gyro, you know you have to constantly reset it because it precesses. Well, the Earth does that in its orbit. goes like this and then comes back to center like a, a spinner when you have, were a child that would spin and it would wobble. Well, the Earth does that as well. And this is a scale of about 20 to 22,000 years. So this accounts for a lot of the Earth's changes in temperature over the past million years. The past 20,000 years, you can see the temperature of the Earth uh, based on um, ice core records in central Greenland is where this particular set of cores were taken. And you can see we don't have a nice smooth curve. It didn't happen like that in the Paleo past. It's not likely to happen like to, the, to the Earth during our lifetimes either it's more likely to be a regular, irregular sort of increase through time. We have actually had cooling. This is the Younger Dryas interval. About 13,000 years ago, the temperature of the Earth plummeted you know, several degrees, several 10 degrees Celsius over just a few decades, and then it heated back up again. And this right here is called the Holocene. This is the past 10,000 years, and this is a very unique time in the past million years of Earth history when the temperature of the planet was relatively stable. This is when society as we know it developed, and this is when coast as we know them developed. Here you have, uh, again, another 20,000 year look. This is the Gulf of Mexico sea level here. You can determine that very easily from, from the geologic record. And these are meltwater pulses, when times when uh, the ice sheets decline more rapidly. So they didn't, it's not linear there or smooth there as well. And as I said, this is when, in the past 10,000 years, this relatively stable period here, when the Earth's um, inhabitants, the humans, uh, developed along coast as we know them. This is when the coast of Louisiana developed as we know it today. About 7,500 years ago, we started having these big deltas form off the coast when the river would flip-flop back and forth across the coast, creating delta lobes. As it would abandon one, 
and go to a more efficient route to the sea, that old delta would start to erode. That's where the Chandelier Islands came from. That's where Grand Isle came from. These are abandoned deltas. Past 10,000 years, start to see an interesting sort of trend here. These are trends in nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. They call this the hockey stick record because it looks like this hockey stick on the end of each one of these. And, you know, the strong scientific viewpoint globally is that these increases here are caused by human activity. There's no other way to explain these increases. Past 100 years, CO2 increased 35%. Methane increased 150%. And the temperature of the planet increased as well. This is a regression analysis through hundreds of temperature gauges around the, the, the Earth. This is with thousands of temperature records here. But you can see that the rate of change through time, 100 years, 150 years, 100 years, 50 years, and 25 years, the rate of change is just continuing to escalate. As you heat up the, the atmosphere, it holds more water. So we have had an increase in the volume and intensity of rainfall over most of the land areas in the northern hemisphere uh, in the past century. But we also had an increase in the number of days. So even though we've had number of dry days, so even though we've had more rainfall, there's been more spacing between rainfall events, which is less effective at maintaining soil moisture. So a lot of the planet is experiencing more severe droughts over the past. Ocean temperature has increased from the surface down to 3,000 meters or more. You can model it very nicely as the temperature of the atmosphere right at the ocean surface has increased, the temperature of the ocean has increased, and it tapers off down the deeper you go. There's been an increase in hurricane, not frequency, but intensity or the destructiveness of hurricanes in some ocean basins, such as the North Atlantic, where hurricanes form that make landfall here in Louisiana an increase in ocean acidity, and the rate of sea level rise past century was at 1.7 meters, millimeters per year, but the past 20 years, or roughly, it's been uh, three millimeters per year. Is this acceleration or actual variability? We don't have enough data here from the satellite altimetry record to really say with confidence that this will hold up, but if it does, it portends a much faster rate of land loss in coastal Louisiana. There's also a geographic distribution in addition to this temporal variability. Spatially, there's a lot of variability in sea level rise. Some parts of the ocean aren't rising as fast as others, but typically off the Gulf Coast, where you've got the shallow Gulf of Mexico basin, uh, the rate of sea level rise has been higher than the global average. This is the actual rate of sea level rise using satellite altimetry since 1993. And you can see that the rate here is 3.3 millimeters per year. So it's higher than it is for the global average in the Gulf of Mexico. And these annual cycles here, this is just the cooling and the heating of the Gulf of Mexico each year, like a big bathtub. And that's just the regression through the whole data set. We've seen a decline in ice and snow, particularly in the northern hemisphere, particularly in the shoulder seasons and in the, the spring and in the fall months a decline in glacial mass of over most of the planet. These are the North American glaciers here. And uh, we haven't seen an increase in the number of tornadoes or in the change in the diurnal temperature range. But um, so some things don't appear to be changing. The ones that I've presented to you, there is a strong consensus, though, that uh, they are, have occurred. And looking at the future, I've talked about the past. Let's talk about the future. These are the scenarios of future changes in temperature through time based upon the emissions. If we kept the emissions of just the froze the atmosphere as it is now, we would still have warming due to the changes that have already occurred in the atmosphere, the enrichment of greenhouse gases and the increase in the water vapor. Water vapor is the most powerful greenhouse gas. Like CO2, it's natural, but there's more of it now than there was in a cooler world. So depending upon the emission scenario, they all project warming, but at different rates. And a report we did for Congress in 2009 for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, some stunning uh, statistics on the observed change is actually higher than the emission scenarios we used in IPCC. 
So we're tracking above, presently, the highest emission scenario, even though we're using these to project impacts. Warming over the next uh, 20 years is expected to be 4, 0.4 degrees. It was 0.75 over the whole past century. So the rate of change, again, we expect to just to continue to escalate, uh, increase through time. Warming highest over uh, land and at high latitudes. Climate change is very likely larger than we saw in the past century, but little difference in the temperature outcomes until about 2040 and beyond, because no matter um, if we reduce emissions, still out to about 2030, it won't matter. It's after about 2030 and beyond that you start to see different changes in temperature depending upon e emissions, that, the decisions we make today. Into the future, these here are the number of frost days, heat waves, and growing season. Everything on the left side of these lines represent the historical record. Standard deviation from the mean through time since 1880 in each case. So we've got a decrease in the number of frost days. Look at the signal in the northern hemisphere. Very strong because of the larger volume or aerial extent rather of, uh, of land and the circulation patterns in the northern hemisphere. So through time, you know, if you could pick the coolest emission scenario even, uh, we expect to see fewer frost days. V1 is, I'm sorry, A2 here in green, that's the warmer one. This is the cooler emission scenario here. An increase in heat waves, increase in growing season. There are some positive aspects of climate change for some growing areas, like in Canada, uh, for agriculture, even though they're losing a lot of their forest species now because of the spruce bark beetle that uh, can, can't tolerate um, real cold winters, so it's expanding into this area. The intensity of precipitation has increased, as I said, through time. We expect it to continue to increase through the end of this century. The intensity of precipitation, shown here, higher. The number of dry days, look at the United States. So the spacing between rainfall events has increased over the past century, and we expect that to be even more pronounced through 2100. This is the projected mean temperature across the top for annual December, January, February, and June, July, and August. The winter signal is stronger for both temperature and precipitation than it is in the summer. And you know, the winter temperatures are what determines the plant cover, the nutria, for example. When I worked for wildlife and fisheries, we had a bounty on nutria. You had to bring in, not the whole animal because they're pretty bad, but you had to cut off the tail of the nutria and we give you $5. Well, those species cannot tolerate really hard winters. So now they're in Del, the Delmarva Peninsula, up the East Coast, they're in Arkansas now. So they're expanding in their range because of these milder winters. The increase in precipitation will be in the northern latitudes, not in the Gulf Coast particularly. We have high confidence that the, the Southwest will even get drier, particularly in the growing season. The number of days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a tipping point for, for some industries. It's how you calculate the length of runways even. Uh, so by the end of the century, we expect to see an increase in the number of days above 90 degrees for, for most of the America. Projected increase in extreme heat, the number of days here between extreme events. Something that would occur once every 20 years, you know, will occur once every year in these dark red areas here. In the southeast, this is the historical precipitation trend. Here's Louisiana. See here, the summer and spring have gotten the growing season, gotten drier. We've had wetter falls, though, through time. 30% increase in the, the, temp the precipitation in the southeast in the fall. This is the future projection. For spring, in areas where we have these hatch marks is where we have high confidence. We see declining rainfall in the spring and summer for most of the Gulf Coast, particularly out here in the, the southwestern United States. An increase in precipitation across Canada and Alaska. And in the winter, a decrease as well. So this affects the water supply, the runoff to the coast, and many other variables that Cynthia may touch upon. Uh, Looking at sea level rise, as you heat the ocean, it expands, like the heat water expands. And uh, so we expect that sea level rise will accelerate this century. Um, and uh, this is the caveat here. 
the projections that were in the last IPCC report do not include, and this is 0.56 meters, 0.59 meters, they do not include rapid losses of ice sheets. This was based on literature ended in 2006. The past five years, the literature has given us a little more to worry about here in Louisiana. The last time the Greenland ice sheet disappeared in the paleo record, sea level was seven meters higher, 22 feet higher than it is presently. And that's just the ice that's captured here in the Greenland ice sheet. So, you know, disintegration of this ice sheet, which appears to be in, uh, the, the rate of loss is the increasing, is something to worry about for our coast here in Louisiana. Uh, for our last report we did for the U.S. Congress, we presented the IPCC estimates along with these more recent estimates for sea level rise, you know, this month, this much. And lots coastal Louisiana is not this much higher than mean sea level. Plus you get the meteorological extremes from southwesterly winds and uh, storms, not even hurricanes. And a lot of our coast goes under. So um, the more recent literature suggests a one to two meter increase in mean sea level by the end of the century. As you increase the temperature of the ocean, it, it expands, as I said, but it also forms a hotbed for hurricane genesis. The growth of hurricanes and the propensity for hurricanes to develop off the African coast here and enter into the Gulf and South Atlantic is higher when the sea surface temperature is higher. These are the actual temperature records based upon the, the paleo data for the main development region, MDR, the main development region where hurricanes form off the African coast here. And these are the hurricane tracks into uh, the Atlantic, the South Atlantic region and the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the temperature record. And you can see it's increased through time. For the Gulf of Mexico, it's increased as well. This is the past record. This is the future record, projected, I should say. Again, we have the past increase in the main development region in the Atlantic for hurricanes that form, that make landfall here. And these are the projections. And in New Orleans, uh, you know, this is a really important thing to remember when you're building infrastructure and levees. Here in Louisiana, we have another problem because the land is sinking. And so the rate of sea level off the Pensacola coast, two millimeters per year, close to the global average last century, compared to Grand Isle, Louisiana, and look at the rate of increase here. That's because the tide gauge is sinking. So in addition to this 1.7 millimeters per year we got last century, a little higher in the Gulf, you've also got the land sinking. So that accounts for most of the, the, the net relative sea level rise in coastal Louisiana. And these are the, if you had four foot of sea level rise, everything in light blue here goes under, including these roads. The net effect uh, shown here is off the Atlantic coast and the Gulf coast is uh, uh, very serious for coastal communities. Looking down Highway 1 as you're driving towards uh, Port Fouchon, that's the Gulf of Mexico out there. Highway 1, when I first started working for LSU Sea Grant in the 70s, uh, you know, this was continuous marsh on each side of this road. And now, with the southeasterly wind, this road goes under, and we're having to elevate Highway 1. Uh, and they're the federal government is helping elevate it because of the importance of this oil and gas infrastructure here down at Bouchon. When this cemetery was built in Terrebonne Parish, it wasn't built underwater. I mean, this is, you know, this is the consequence of the subsidence of the land surface and the sea level increasing and the lack of sediment getting into the river from the river. I'm going to end with a few ecological consequences in addition to those I've mentioned and some things we might do. There's some consequences you might not think about. Uh, talked about nutria. We've got Chinese tallow in Louisiana. And every time we have a canopy gap in Louisiana forest, we have Chinese tallow take over. It's an exotic species that is freeze intolerant. So when we have these mild winters, we have Chinese tallow. This is down in southwest Louisiana. Just takes over everything in red. Beautiful color but a very little value to wildlife. As you increase the temperature and you increase uh, the number of dry days, you have this propensity for more intense wildfires. 
In coastal Louisiana, the, the landowners burned the marsh in the past to create habitat for muskrat and nutria when they were trapping these critters. But now if we have a lightning-induced fire, when it's real dry, it can actually burn the root mass as well. So um, in addition to the lower soil moisture causing more fires, we have what was called the Brown Marsh event back around 2000 where we lost hundreds of thousands of acres of Louisiana's coast. This is uh, the, the uh, Chafalai Bay area over here, and this is what we call the Brown Marsh. It turned brown and it turned to open water. And most of the scientists believe that this was caused by uh, herbivory. Uh, the plants were stressed due to the lack of freshwater inflows coupled with the high evaporation rates that caused uh, stress on the plants and pathogens that were able to attack the plants and kill them. As sea level rises, we're going to see uh, ghost forests develop around our coast. This is uh, down in between, in near Houma, Louisiana. We call this the ghost forest. You know, bald cypress trees, they are not salt tolerant. The salinity of the Gulf is 35 parts per thousand. If you expose bald cypress trees to three parts per thousand, for just a few days, they start to get stressed. And if you have hurricanes that put the water on top of it and that salt water stays there, the plants will die, the trees will die. So we have these ghost forests. So we have a, sh a change in the vegetation that is occurring as we've got higher mean sea level intruding further into these formerly freshwater environments. Not only have the plants changed, we've also seen a loss of some plants completely. Here's New Orleans here, a beautiful photo of, of a ghost swamp looking into the city of New Orleans. This swamp that was out here protected this levee down in St. Bernard. That's the Mississippi River there. And without that protection of that forest, when the hurricane made landfall, it just washed away the sediments. So we're seeing a conversion of some of these forests because they can't, they can't be replaced by salt marsh <laughs> fast enough. They're just turning from fresh forest to open water. This is the first report I did, my name was Van Sickle back then, uh, when I worked for LSU, that documented an increase in the salinity. This is Jefferson Parish over here, that's Grand Isle. This is the Barataria Basin. And the occurrence of oyster spatfall through time just migrated further and further inland as the water got saltier. So we're seeing it in plants and animals. Low-lying Gulf Coast ecosystems will be inundated uh, more rapidly as sea level rises. Everything in red on this slide was converted to open water between 1932 and the year 2000. Everything in red was lost, converted to open water. A lot of the protective defenses for our communities here along uh, Bay Lafourche and New Orleans. In Alabama, they have uh, the Dolphin Island area, and this is uh, some of our, we'll call LIDAR. Each one of these is a, is a house. This is the road that goes down Dolphin Island looking west. Gulf of Mexico on the left, Mississippi Sound on the right. This is pre-Hurricane Ivan. We flew the LIDAR again right after Ivan, and you can see the, the shoreline is eroding back into and under these houses. The sediment that was here on the shore face is now in the road, and that's post-Katrina, Dolphin Island. That's what it looks like on the ground. So these things are happening much more rapidly than we've seen in the past, in the geologic past as a result of all these stressors that are being put, the changes in the intensity of storms, rising sea level and so forth, and human development activity as well. So as coastal tidal and storm surge flooding increases, uh, we're likely to see more of these intense uh, flooding events that will affect uh, human development, roads, and people. This is down in the, the Leeville area of Louisiana during Hurricane uh, Rita. Looks like a sea out there. That's part of that marsh I showed you earlier. Uh, the interactions of climate change and other stressors like the oil spill are very poorly understood. This is, I flew over South Louisiana a few months ago. I'm on the Science and Engineering Board for uh, the state to, in the Coastal Restoration Program. I took this photo. That's oil there. And that's just a couple of months ago. And the interaction of the oil with all of the other things that are going on to destroy this little mass of wetland in the Barataria Basin, you know, we just don't understand the interactions or the tip or tipping points. And I think there will be surprises in the future for us. 
Some barrier island coasts, like the Chandelier Islands here, this is the track of Hurricane Katrina as it made landfall. Everything in red was converted to open water overnight. About 217 square miles of wetland lost in Louisiana overnight. So you've got the Chandelier Island chain there. It's, it's an old delta low from several thousand years ago. And this is pre-Katrina, and that's post-Katrina. And this, you know, hurricanes make this, this, uh, this counterclockwise motion. So as that hurricane's turning out there, this barrier island chain is a very important protective feature for the wetlands that protect the city of New Orleans. And so through time, uh, we're seeing them segmented and diminished in aerial extent. In Mississippi, a similar story. This is Ship Island here. This is after Katrina, where it's split. Uh, we call it the Camille. We, when I grew up in Bluffs, we call this the Camille Cut. It wasn't there before 1968. And now we call it the Camille Katrina Cut. And look what's happened in that island chain over the past 150 years. Tremendous loss. In that island chain, all those islands protect that coast. There's thresholds in the sustainability of people as well as ecosystems. In Louisiana, we have Native Americans that live in these fragile environments that are deteriorating very rapidly. Uh, this is uh, some photos from the Ile de Jean Charles Band of the Chittimacha Indians. They have their own ghost forest, you can see right there. And through time, this Native American community has dwindled to just a few families because this road here that used to flood every 20 to 30 years now goes under every year. The, the tribe has petitioned the, uh, the uh, Terrebonne Parish Police Jury to help them evacuate their area and to move to safe ground. So what can be done? You know, we are not helpless. There are things that can be done to reduce the effects of climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions or enhancing carbon sinks in ecosystems like wetlands, or we can adapt and take purposeful actions that will reduce the impacts of climate change on coast. For one thing, we can reduce the non-climate stressors. This is down in Cameron Parish, the oil company that built these levees here. They didn't realize that they were preventing the sheet flow of sediment to that marsh, which is gone now. The intercoastal waterway, when it was dredged, it was just a few hundred feet wide. Now it's two miles wide at some places. You know, just the destructive, I signed permits when I was with the Coastal Zone Management Program. And knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have signed those permits. But 30 years ago, we just didn't know. Reducing the risk of catastrophic fires, uh, you know, reducing the, the, the forest fuel. Fires can, are good prescribed fires, can, can help maintain uh, healthy ecosystems because we've taken fire out of ecosystems uh, through controlled uh, preventing wildfires. <clears throat> preventing and controlling non-native species. We've already got the nutrient here. It was brought in by the McElhaney's back in the 40s for fur. But when we go out and do our restoration for ball cypress, we've learned we just put up these little tree shelters around the seedlings and the, and the nutrient won't jerk them out. You know, preventing the control or controlling the effects of non-native species that will explode if uh, the continued increase in temperature plays out as we expect. Maintaining uh, connected and diverse fish and wildlife populations so they can, can cope with the changes that are projected for the future. Adapting infrastructure. Now when this house was built, it was not built to have a blowout first floor, but that's the consequence of Hurricane Katrina. But building our infrastructure and elevating houses so that people aren't put in harm's way is one way to deal with or adapt to climate change. Not relying on historical changes or historical projections of, we used to have a bag limit of 12 ducks, you know, now we have a bag limit of six ducks or five ducks, depending upon what the surveys tell us. So not, you know, doing things the way we did last century because the environment is changing, whether you're managing fish or wildlife. Adjusting our harvest and yield for, for marine fisheries is certainly uh, a smart thing to think about through time. Establishing corridors for species migration. This is right across the river in the Yazoo Basin of Mississippi, and it's hard to imagine that wildlife can, can, can migrate across this sea of agriculture. That's why connecting refuge lands is really important through time. Retreating. Uh, in some areas, retreat may be the most cost-effective option. 
My parents lost their home in Katrina and uh, had evacuated many, many times. And actually, we grew up in Biloxi, and we thought Camille was the benchmark. It was BC. Everything was BC, measured BC before Camille, you know. And after that, Katrina was such a surprise. Uh, so retreat is what they did uh, rather than rebuild. And finally, <coughs> factoring our understanding of all these processes in how we manage ecosystems. Whether you're talking about the, the moving of a lighthouse or the maintenance of a marsh. My last slide. If I were working for the state again or managing a tract of land in the coast, you know, I would do things differently now. I would focus more on water. You know, we think of Louisiana as a water-rich state. Well, with the, tr the trend in droughts, more intense droughts that we've got here, and the fracking of, uh, of the, um, the subsurface up north where they're using water for injection, there's a real competition for water, and a lot of times the conservation interests aren't at the table. I would stop the damage to the coast as much as I could and put the river back in its delta. I told someone earlier tonight the river may as well be going through North Carolina the way we've managed it in the past. You know, the sediment that is coming from that river is essential for maintaining Louisiana's coast. I would inventory species like we have in the past, but I would also try to keep a thumbprint on those that are on the edge through monitoring and pay attention to our species that are on the edge, our threatened and endangered species. I would try to develop predictive tools that would help us understand how fire, for example, here's a controlled burn just a couple of months ago in St. Bernard Parish, using uh, understanding disturbance and trying to manage for it, taking a more dynamic view of systems, and finally, education. If I had my last dollar to spend, it would be on education. And that's why I came tonight, actually. I do speak a lot, and that's, that's why. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm probably not as good a speaker as Dr. Burkett, but that's okay. Um, and also, you may hear a little bit of duplication because um, we have some very similar messages. Uh, and finally, I want to say that it makes me a little nervous because there are about four or five people in this audience who are more expert on the topic I'm going to talk about than I am. So please understand that I preface my discussion with that. Uh, I am executive director of the Gulf Restoration Network. And for those of you who don't know us, we are a network of groups from Texas to Florida that work on issues that touch on the health of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, our mission is to empower people to protect and restore the resources of the Gulf of Mexico. And we do it predominantly right now in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Florida, where I have staff. We also work on regional issues that touch Texas and Alabama. Um, we have four priority issues, which you can see here, all of which I'm afraid were affected during the BP Horizon disaster. Um, and I have a lot of information on impacts from the BP Horizon disaster, but that's not what I came to talk to you about tonight. And I will do it in question and answer. I just gave a briefing yesterday on marine impacts of the BP disaster. Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about is a little different perspective um, of the impacts of the oil and gas industry on this state and what our relationship with that industry has actually done to us and the crossroads we are now facing. Um, you know, by 1980, Louisiana had lost 46 percent of its wetlands, and we continue to wet lose wetlands at a an, pretty extreme rate when you look at anywhere else in the United States. Um, and that is, as Virginia showed, becoming a very significant problem for those of us who live in New Orleans, much less somebody who lives in Houma or uh, Thibodeau or Ile de Jean Charles. Um, and this loss of wetlands is placing a lot of communities at risk because those wetlands protect people. So for Louisianans, wetlands are not just an environmental issue. They are a community protection issue. And um, they jeopardize a lot of what goes on in this state because we are, although most people in the United States don't seem to recognize it, we provide some significant national resources, including the navigation that cannot exist without wetlands that protect the Mississippi River, the fact that um, we produce 30% of the domestic seafood that is consumed in the United States. And we also have a unique culture uh, that cannot be replaced in anywhere else. 
Um, and so, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit in context because we had an amazing amount of wetlands in Louisiana when, you know, many, many hundreds of years ago. And this is what it looked like in 1839. And if you know the history of the, of the wetlands of Louisiana, we were created by the Mississippi River, which is called the Big Muddy for a reason. It carries significant sediment that in fact flowed through floods into our wetlands and nourished those wetlands, creating a very healthy ecosystem. And slowly but surely, as man moved in, we started to see the loss of those wetlands. And there is a direct link between what humans have done and the loss we have suffered. Um, and so by 2020, I'll go back. Nope, all right, I can't go back. I hate these things. Oh, there. Uh, by 2020, between all of the impacts that I will discuss with you, we are going to look like this. And if any of you live in the Gulf, in the in the coastal areas, you will know that that puts a lot of us at risk, including people in, in New Orleans who I've heard sometimes referred to as soon to be an island in the middle of water. Um, so I think we need to realize this, and I often bring this very not positive message to people who live here, but something I think we need to know and discuss. And the causes of wetland loss are in fact many and varied. And they started in 1927 after the 1927 flood when the Corps of Engineers, at the request of the Congress, decided to adopt what's known as the levees only policy. And that levees only policy resulted in levees largely from St. Louis all the way down that cut the river off from the wetlands. And that in fact stopped the spring flooding that was needed to nourish our wetlands. So it's sort of the first nail in the coffin. So all of a sudden, you have wetlands that by their very nature sink and require fresh nourishment to then rise sort of again. So, you know, and so instead what we had was sinking wetlands with nothing to go on top of them to make them rise again. So you have a sinking environment. Um, and then you have the oil and gas industry. This is what um, the coastal Louisiana actually looks like offshore and onshore. It is estimated that by 1980, we had 10,000 miles of canals in, throughout Louisiana's wetlands. And that's a pretty significant impact when you understand both how those canals were made um, and what they did. So um, starting in the 1940s, of course, we had the, the push for oil and gas development, which we understand and was the basis of the growth of this nation, and I understand that. Nor do I think that anybody did this on purpose, so don't think that I think that somebody came into the Louisiana and said, we're gonna dig up all the wetlands and it's all gonna go away. Um, but they did start to develop these canals, and the canals were necessary to get pipeline out to bring oil in. But the problem was that as they built these pipelines, they um, actually, as Virginia said, sloughed off the mud onto the sides of those canals, which created little itty bitty levees along each one of those canals. That then cut off any of the wetland muds and, or the muds and the sediments and the water from going into the wetlands behind them and the wetlands behind them died. In addition, you had saltwater intrusion, which we hear a lot about because you know, as Virginia talked about, and as many people will tell you, different types of wetland require different salinity regimes and can tolerate different salinities. And so if you have a straight canal, as all of these are, from a more saline marsh to a less saline marsh, you have a lot of salt water that's going in. And it begins to kill off a lot of what's in those areas. Um, and it's estimated that between 40 to 60 percent of the wetlands in Louisiana have been lost because of these canals. Not directly, but indirectly. As we saw that with the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, you can have saltwater intrusion, you can have boat wake, you can have all of these different causes that then result in those wetlands disappearing. And so I guess my point and, and you know, what we try to stress is the impacts of the oil and gas industry on the wetlands of Louisiana did not just happen last year. All right, last year is only the final assault. It is the only the final impact that the industry has had, or not the final, I, I fear that we're gonna have more, but it is the latest, I, I guess you would say. And you know, we have other causes. We built urban development 
you know, in these wetlands. And sadly, sometime in the 50s or 60s, we decided we wanted to look like Illinois or Indiana, so we're no longer elevated and we're all slab on grade and we take out a lot of wetlands. We had deforestation. The latest assault on that was the fact that most of your cypress mulch is built from, is, is created by cutting down cypress forests and mulching it so that people can put it on their lawns under the mistaken belief that it has some kind of termite avoidance nature and then agricultural use. Um, and, you know, current estimates are that Hurricane Katrina, as Virginia said, took out 217 square miles of wetlands. And then we have climate change. And these are the pictures of what it's going to look like if, in fact, relative sea level rise occurs as is predicted. So, as you can see, we had a lot to deal with before the BP Horizon disaster. But this is the latest assault. Currently, there, it's estimated, and it's a very loose estimate, that, fifth, that we have five square miles of impacts. And I, I swear to you, I'm not very good at math, and I tried to find a conversion of that to acres, but I couldn't. There's no, nothing that would convert that for me to acres, so it's five square miles. Um, and most of the people I know who go out there say that the oil is still there. There are no good options to clean it up. We saw this the other day. It's some kind of rake. They're trying to excavate the wetlands, which is definitely going to kill it. If the oil didn't, it will. And then we have now air cannons to chase off our wildlife because they're afraid it's going to get oiled again. So most of the areas that were bird rookeries are no longer bird rookeries. They're now cannon areas. So you hear air cannons and flashing and stuff. Um, and then beach cleaning disrupts beach life. I mean, it's pretty sad that we've heard that people are actually, you know, they're, they're taking all the sand with everything living in it and they're steam cleaning it. So they're killing everything in it. Um, so, you know, the effect of cleaning may be more devastating than the oil itself. We don't know. I mean, it's uncertain. Um, and, you know, I, I think in my estimation, what I have seen and what dis disturbs me most in this state in the last 15 years I've worked here is I have not seen any reduction in the rate of loss of wetlands through permitting. I see oil and gas canals being built every year. I see more and more acres. I mean, my, it's gotten so bad that my staff does not work on a wetland permit unless it's 50 acres or more because there are too many wetland permits for us to actually review and to fight despite the fact that we are asking the United States to pay 14 to $50 billion to restore our wetlands. And many people in the United States are asking us, well, if you're not committed to restoring and protecting your wetlands, why should we be? Why should we pay billions of dollars to help you save what you're not willing to save yourself? So for us, one of the issues is the oil and in gas industry helped us destroy our wetlands and we feel they should be held accountable to help restore them. And part of that is not that they should stop oil and gas development, don't get me wrong, I drive a car, I like my car, I really do. But you know, they should be required to stop building all these canals and or to backfill their own canals. There are lots of oil and gas canals out there that the Park Service has proven in one example can be backfilled and will restore pretty quickly in that one area and will stop the bleeding. So it's like a, a vein that's been opened. You can shut it. Now it may not be hundreds of thousands of acres, but it is small restoration that can stop the bleeding and it will not cost the oil industry that much. And then really, when it comes to the 19 to $50 billion, they need to give us a percentage of that to help us move forward. Not just the BPs of the world, but all of the oil companies that have made money off of these, of, of Louisiana and Louisiana's resources and have placed us, at least in part, in this position. So we are at a crossroads. And the other issues we have to face, which are a crossroads issue and are going to require change, is how do we actually restore these wetlands? There are not that many solutions. There's diversion, which is reintroducing the river and the, and the sediments. And I don't mean water, freshwater diversions, because freshwater is not what we need. We need sediment. So we need to be able to capture the sediment in the river and move it into the wetlands. And then we do need pipeline sediment delivery in many areas to speed that and then have 
river flooding to in fact enhance once we've built those wetlands through pipeline and sediment delivery. And it's not very pretty, but it builds wetlands fast. But to be honest, you can't maintain wetlands after you've done this unless you have some connection to the river or to fresh water and sediment to maintain it. And the other thing is, as Virginia said, and we work with Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation and Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana on what we call the multiple lines of defense strategy. And it means that we have to determine what we have in terms of natural resources we can restore and protect that provide us with our first line of defense against storms because wetlands reduce storm surge. Four miles of wetlands is, is, is predicted to, to provide up to one foot of storm surge reduction. And then we have to be smart and we have to elevate. We have to elevate infrastructure, we have to elevate our houses, and we need to, to also leave when it starts to come because we may not be able to safeguard ourselves. But we have to learn how to live with flooding as our forefathers did. We can't continue to live slab on grade and think that we are not gonna flood. That's just the reality of the future of many areas in this state. And so this is a strategy, it's actually pretty simple. Um, it's the concept it is, has been adopted by the Louisiana in its comprehensive master plan and the National Academies of Science. So in philosophy, it's been adopted. In practicality, I haven't really seen it put into any of the planning unless, you know, I did have one guy in a coastal parish tell me that three levees was multiple lines of defense. But I don't think that's exactly what we were talking about um, because levees cost a lot of money and in this budget climate, we're not going to get a lot of levees. And so, that's sort of my message, is that Louisiana is at a crossroads, but we also need to understand that the current assault on our wetlands by the oil industry is not the first assault. And believe me, the uncertainties as to the impact of that assault are still huge. The impact on the people of this state and the resources of this state may not be known for 10 or 15 years, and my frustration level at people telling me it's all gone and it wasn't a catastrophe is really really huge. 15 years of my work may have gone down the drain in one year. But we have got to realize that they are part of this community and they need to help us restore this community and keep it going forever. So I thank you very much. It's an honor to speak here to you, to you tonight. Um, I want to thank Leslie and Bob for their heroic efforts in organizing this event um, and for their conviction that a story like the one that I wrote about Aaron Greco's decision in the midst of the worst oil spill in U.S. history to follow in the footsteps of his father and become a fisherman has an important place in an event like this that seeks to probe the impact of the spill on the Gulf Coast. It's not necessarily an obvious choice. The Grecos are not suing BP. They have been compensated for their losses and they are satisfied with what they got. Like many fishermen up and down the Gulf Coast, they are getting back to work. The shrimping season, Buddy says, looks to be a good one. And Aaron is spending quite a bit of time getting his own rigging ready so that he can try and beat his dad in what will finally be his first full season on the boat. It is not, in other words, their story is not the story of lives overturned by environmental disaster, which I think as journalists, as activists, as academic critics, is a standard narrative that we tend to look for that may be perhaps too easy to tell. Yet I think, I hope, that their story helps illuminate why the potential destruction of commercial fishing as a way of life here is worth worrying about why it would be tragic if new safeguards were not put in place to prevent another oil spill, why it is important for Americans to understand where their seafood comes from, and what it would mean for it to all be produced in farms rather than wild caught in the bayou off of Delacroix Island where Buddy and Aaron and Buddy's wife Carolyn grew up. We are very lucky to have the Greco family with us in the audience tonight. And I want to introduce them. There they are up here. This is the Grecos. 
I'm very, I'm very excited that they're here. I spent a lot of time with them over the last year. And, uh, but before I tell you more about them and a little bit more about how I came to tell their story, I'm going to show a video that, um, that we made, the, the New York Times. I'm sure you all read the New York Times every day, so you know. <laughs> but um, if, in case you don't, on our website, we often show videos along with our stories now. And so um, with a colleague of mine, I helped produce a video that I think probably tells their story better than my mere words can. So if we can um, show that now, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. Ever since he can remember, Aaron Greco has wanted to be a fisherman. Yeah, I grew up into this, going a boat with my dad, and this is what I would do. I'd, I'd play in the salt tank. I'd clean the shrimp. I thought it was fun. Aaron grew up on his father's boats, here in the tight-knit fishing village of Delacroix Island, some 30 miles south of New Orleans. I'm Amy Harmon, a reporter for the New York Times. For the past six months, I've been visiting the Grecos as Aaron weighs the risks of taking on the family business at a time of great uncertainty in the Gulf fishing industry. But then they called all the fishermen to a meeting and they told us what was going on. And then right there it made you feel like it was just going. There was nothing you could do. It was going to come in and wipe us out. Aaron dreamed of working with his father, Buddy, on his fishing boat. But then in April, the BP oil rig exploded and millions of gallons of oil gushed into the Gulf. You know, it was kind of moving our way, but I mean, we had, I, I mean, I was nervous. I mean, you know, I, I was worried. But oil wasn't Aaron's only obstacle. Today, American consumers eat mostly cheap farm shrimp from overseas. The availability of this overseas product uh, overshadows the availability of the Louisiana product because of its, basically because of its price. It's not because of its quality, it's because of its price. Only 5% of the shrimp we eat is wild caught in American waters by fishermen like Buddy and Aaron. Though Buddy makes a decent living fishing, he wanted his son to have other options. I wanted him to be sure he wanted to do this before he got into it. I didn't want him just quit school and jumping into it. Buddy did just that, leaving school in 10th grade to make a living on the water. I quit school one day, the next day I was fishing. He never learned to read and insisted that his son graduate from high school. Please. Aaron graduated last year. Teachers urged him to consider college, but he gravitated back to the water. If you squeeze your girlfriend's hand like you squeeze that nozzle, she's going to think you're a girl. What a mess you make. I ain't going to grab it. Hey. Get a bucket, put a little bit in the bucket. This was to be his first year fishing full time with his father. But the oil spill derailed their plans. Fishing had to be put on hold. Buddy and Aaron signed up with BP to run boom to protect the fragile marshes from encroaching oil. Aaron wasn't pulling in shrimp, but he was making good money. I was deck in with my dad, and he actually gave me his captain's pay, and he kept his boat pay, so he helped me out a lot. By the time the well was capped and the fishing areas reopened, Aaron had bought a hot rod Mustang. This is my donut. That's his favorite part. <laughs> he also bought a fishing boat that has allowed him to step fully into the life he has always wanted. You're outside, you got marsh around you, you leave in the morning, you got a nice view of the sun coming up, different colors in the sky, it's nice. Almost ironically, the oil spill allowed Aaron to captain his own boat before he even had a chance to work alongside his father. His mother, Carolyn, worries that it is all happening too fast. He doesn't know all the stuff he needs to know. And yeah, he's going to learn. But if he would have been on a boat with you, he would have learned. Now he, he has a boat, yeah. He don't have experience. It's bittersweet for Buddy as well. I love having him with me. I worked by myself the last two days, and it's not the same as having him on side of me. But for Aaron, the boat, like his fast car, means freedom. You work for yourself. You don't have nobody to answer to. 
It's just you, your boat, and your deck in if you want. And the only other place I think something's like this is a farmer. Here's basically what it is. Your farm is just on the water. But making a living on the water is still uncertain. The full effects of the oil spill may not be known for years, and drilling in the Gulf has resumed. Most worrisome are wild shrimp prices, which have been dropping for decades. Today, a fisherman gets about a dollar for a pound of shrimp, half of what it was 20 years ago. Man, I'd be happy with $100 a day <laughs> just to make it. But I mean, a decent day, I really don't know what you would call a decent day, because one day you can catch a basket, the next day you can catch 20 baskets. On a recent day, Aaron caught just enough shrimp to fill a basket, about 70 pounds. Many of the older and seasoned people are, are feeling a bit frustrated about making a decent living, so it's very difficult for the younger generation to actually be incorporated. That being the case, there's a tremendous magnetism for young people to go into the seafood harvest sector. Um, the independence, the flexibility, the, the sense of camaraderie that they have, and the, the sense of accomplishment, that they're doing something that is not only honorable for themselves, but it's honorable for their fathers, their grandfathers, and in some cases, their great-grandfathers. Mom and dad's family did it. Something I feel like I have to do. I don't know how else to describe it. You know, it's in there. It's what I know since I was a little kid to be on a boat, and there's nothing else that I want to do. I mean, I'll play with a car now and then, help somebody out, but bottom line is this is what I want to do. Thanks. So will you just flip through the pictures, like, one by one, you know? Um, I'm just going to, these slides are just, these are fabulous, beautiful, brilliant pictures that are taken by Jennifer Zidon, who is also here in the audience. Yay. Um, and she, she, um, I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about um, sort of my story about how I came to write about the Grecos and, and then weave together, you know, hopefully I'll tell you a little bit about their story and Jennifer is a part of both of our stories. So, um, so in the days and months uh, that followed the oil spill, the New York Times sent literally dozens of reporters and photographers here to cover the story. You all remember it. You lived through it. The oil wouldn't stop spewing into the Gulf and the media wouldn't stop reporting on it. Journalists from all over the world descended on your little area of the world. It was on TV, newspapers, radio, all spill all the time. I think the iconic image um, that sticks in my mind, I think in everybody's mind, is that we showed it there, the underwater camera at the site of the well with a black oil billowing out that showed on the corner of CNN for, you know, for weeks. Um, your local paper, the Times-Picayune, did a great job of covering the spill. I often logged on to NOLA.com to keep up with the news. Yay. <laughs> um, and my colleagues at the other times covered every angle, too. Um, Campbell Robertson, based right here in New Orleans, wrote about the struggles between local and federal authorities over how to handle the cleanup. Um, Leslie Kaufman tracked the heartbreaking death of birds, turtles, pelicans, and whales tainted by oil. Uh, David Barstow and other investigative reporters uh, at the Times dug up evidence of how corporate pressure to plug the Macondo well and move on to the next one contributed to the failure to see the warning signs that led to the explosion. Um, and everyone, it seemed to me, was writing about the threatened livelihood of Gulf, Gulf Coast fishermen. So when my editor asked me to come down here, I thought, well, what is left for me to write about? Um, I argued with him to the extent that you're allowed to argue with your boss. Um, you know, I, I'm not an environmental reporter. I told I'm not an expert on the Gulf Coast region, and I don't know about oil wells. And um, but I, I had written some stories for the paper that are um, that take a certain that that are called narratives. They're not news stories or investigative exposés. Um, they're stories that follow someone over a period of months to show how their lives are changed by a particular event and hopefully to illuminate some broader issue. Um, and my editor wanted a story like that. So I lost my argument. Um, and I came to New Orleans for the first time. I had never been here before, just before Memorial Day of last year. 
uh, not knowing who I was going to talk to or how I was going to find this elusive story. Um, fortunately for me, I immediately met up with Jennifer, um, who, uh, the brilliant photographer, remember, she's, you're seeing all of her pictures. Um, uh, and she, she lives here, and she had already started uh, reporting a photo essay about the um, impact of the, of the spill on, on local fishermen. Um, and she very graciously and generously handed over all of her phone numbers. Um, and after a few days of reporting, I, I had more phone numbers. Um, but the day that we met Aaron and Buddy on their lunch break from BP cleanup training, I knew that these were the ones I wanted to follow. Aaron fascinated me because he had a choice. He was 19, just out of school, a valued member of the track team with decent grades and a decent, you know, <laughs> um, and a talent for fixing up used Mustangs. He had spent the previous months helping Buddy repair his, his boat so it would be ready for the shrimping season that in May of last year looked unlikely to ever happen, or we didn't know if any shrimp season would ever happen again. Buddy was worried at that point, as all the fishermen were. No one knew what the impact of the spill would be. For fishermen who had grown up fishing and know nothing else, it was a really scary time, and many reporters wrote about their plight. But Aaron, it seemed to me, could take a different path. Even before the oil spill, many young men growing up in fishing communities like the one on Delacro were choosing other professions than the ones their fathers and grandfathers had chosen. As we said in the video, the price of shrimp had dropped steadily um, because of all of the imported farm shrimp. <laughs> there, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that Americans had taken to eating. Um, and it was hard, fishing, it was, it's hard. It's hard and it's dangerous. Buddy would be the first to tell you. He had even sunk his oyster boat. Um, before Katrina, which was a dark moment that left him without his own boat for quite a few years. Um, and now, when I met them, several million barrels of oil and a couple million, million gallons of dispersant were threatening the ecosystem that Aaron had counted on to provide his livelihood. So he could go to community college, he could go to mechanic school or set up shop without going to school, but he wanted to be a fisherman. We didn't know at that point what was going to happen, but I knew if I spent time with the Grecos, I would learn something, and hopefully my readers would too. So I kept coming back. Over June and July and August, I ate a lot of Carolyn's delicious gumbo and fralines, <laughs> and I learned about what it was like for Buddy and Carolyn growing up on the bayou. If I can quote for a minute from my own story, um, I wrote, um, others may have regarded them as poor, but the truth was teenagers could make good money in those days on the brackish waters that flowed into the Gulf. In 1986, the year Buddy and Carolyn's first child, Brittany, arrived, wild-caught shrimp still accounted for nearly a quarter of the shrimp Americans ate, commanding the equivalent of nearly $2 per pound dockside. And when Aaron was born in 1990, Buddy covered the hospital bill with a few hundred sacks of $27 each, of oysters at $27 each. I paid for your stinky behind in that bayou, he liked to remind his son. And it didn't take long for the lesson to stick. Aaron spent his childhood catching minnows with a scoop net in a ditch near their home, his shrimper boots reaching up to his shorts. On fishing trips with his father, he lined up the little fish that dropped from the netting and stuffed them in his pockets. <laughs> you take those out of there, his mother commanded when she caught him. They get in my washer and dryer, I'm gonna have a smell out of this world. <clears throat> There was a moment over the summer that seemed to me to be a turning point for Aaron. His uncle had offered to sell him a boat for a good price, and he was sitting on some of the money he'd made from BP cleanup duty. But Aaron hadn't taken the uncle up on the offer yet. He was obsessed with Mustangs, as we demonstrated, and that money could have bought him his first brand new one, a 2010 model, or 2011. Uh, you can tell me later. <laughs> um, he spent a lot of time looking at car magazines in those days. And then one day, and to me, it seemed like he just wasn't sure. He was, you know, the, we couldn't tell what was going to happen and it didn't seem like such a sure thing. And then one day he and Buddy w were sent out by the BP crew to look for oil in Black Bay. They went right by the site where Buddy had sunk his oyster boat years earlier. For Buddy, that was a hard place to visit. But I think it gave Aaron the courage of his convictions. And I'm just going to read another quick passage. On July 15th, Buddy and Aaron were instructed to drive out to look for oil in Black Bay, where Buddy had sunk his oyster boat years earlier. With the GPS, they navigated to the precise spot where his dredge post was still sticking up out of the shallow water. 
It was hard to relive the sudden storm, the old boat going under in seconds, standing up to his neck in water, hoisting up 100-pound sacks of oysters to rescue them. It was maybe the worst that could befall a fisherman, other than drowning. It's not a good feeling, he told his son. It was pretty in the bay that morning. The air smelled good. Aaron looked at his father. Oh, Daddy, he said with no mockery in his voice, you just caught yourself too many oysters that day. And to me, that kind of captured the spirit of, you know, they're just going to go out and do it and keep doing it and try to keep doing it, even in the face of all of this danger that my fellow panelists have described. Aaron um, bought his own boat soon after, and as I watched them work to fix it up, the Grecos talked about what they loved about fishing, about being your own boss, no two days being the same, and the sheer beauty of the water and the wind and the changing sky. And I kind of nodded and took notes, and I waited for something to happen to tell me it was time to write the story. I think they began to wonder if I would ever write the story, <laughs> or if maybe I just kept thinking of excuses not to write it because I was addicted to Carolyn's cooking. And finally, on my last trip to see them in November, the waters had been reopened to fishing, and Aaron's boat was ready. It was 6 a.m. when we set out down the bayou, heading into the sunrise. I sat on the deck, forgetting to take notes. And that is when I finally understood why this is what Aaron wanted to do with his life. Spill or no spill, competition with farm shrimp from abroad, or whatever. My editors may have been hoping for the more familiar narrative of lives ruined by oil. But to me, Aaron's choice, which was made before the water was deemed safe for fishing, is a testament to the power of a way of life that is one of the last vestiges of an American ideal. The ability to work with your hands, to live off the land, or as they do, off the water. And that is a warning to the rest of us, too, that if that is lost, we all stand to lose. My editors, in the end, agreed. They let the story run at 3,500 words, about three times longer than the average New York Times story, with huge pictures of Jennifer's um, that drew everybody's eye. And I think it resonated. <clears throat> I got many emails about it, and at least one movie producer got in touch with the Grecos, although I don't think they've signed anything yet, just in case anyone else is interested. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, what we'd like to do is to spend about 20 minutes with questions, if we can. And, uh, and I would ask anybody who has a question to, to uh, uh, make it a short question and very pointed. And we'll ask the uh, panelists if they'll do the same thing with the answers. So do we have, uh, do we have a microphone? microphone right there, if anybody would like to? Please speak into it so everyone can hear. I'd like to ask the Grecos if they're finding oil in the water these days. He said he's never seen his first drop of oil in his work. Um, there were lots of strategies for ameliorating the effects of the oil coming ashore in the wetlands and out in the water. Um, I was brought to my attention that there are several businesses that uh, produce a product that is basically naturally occurring bacteria eating oil isolated off the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, they were frustrated because uh, they were not able to use that approach. The, the EPA and the federal government, whoever was in charge of it, uh, didn't seem to want to even investigate that uh, as a possibility. Of the, it's like sawdust that you sprinkle on the marsh. All you had to do is add the water and naturally occurring bacteria begin to degrade it supposedly in six or eight weeks, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the of the oil mass. Do you guys know anything about that and why the choices were made that were made to try to uh, uh, remove the oil using the ways that they used? Well, I do know that in the weeks and months of the disaster, we were contacted by probably hundreds and hundreds of technology um, gurus who thought that they had, you know, biological agents that could do it. And many of them were actually approved in Delaware and in, in the California coast. Um, but they hadn't gone through the, some formal, very mysterious approval process. And supposedly at one point, BP had a number they were supposed to call, but they got lost in that number. And then EPA and NOAA 
and Coast Guard set up a process. But as far as we know, except for the Kevin and Costner technology and the, was it called the whale the something? The whale. whale. Um, most of those technologies did not get through. Now, the one thing that I've learned about the Coast Guard, and, and it's not a bad thing, but like engineers, they really like mechanical solutions. They do not seem to be comfortable with biological solutions. And I don't know why that is, but in a congressional hearing, I was listening to the testimony of the Coast Guard who were really happy, and they told me I was wrong, that they did have a new technology. The newest technology was oil burning. That that was a really, that was one of their newest technologies and that they were really happy that they could burn the oil and they thought that was a, but it seemed to be more technologically oriented than it, they, they aren't comfortable with the biological agents and I don't know why, I really don't. Hello? Um, I was just wondering, um, do y'all know since the oil spill, like, it, like how the oysters have been affected, if, there, if there's been less that have been far, like that have been caught? Is there any? Well, it really probably depends on what geographic area you're talking about. I mean, there was a significant number of oysters that were destroyed when diversions were open to try to push the water offshore. And then we were told, we've been told by some of the Native Americans at least, that their oyster beds haven't in fact died related to oil inundation as it came in or at least that's what they believe has happened. Um, but a lot of the oyster beds in Louisiana weren't affected. So it really depends on what, where you are and, and sort of, you know, because there were a lot of areas in the Gulf that weren't affected. So it, it really depends on whether the oil came in. Like Bay Jimmy was hit really, really hard, but other areas were not hit very hard at all. So it, it I, I haven't heard, I mean, I know at one point oysters were much more expensive because they were, um, were in short supply, but I thought that was because of the closure at one point and then they reopened. Do you know? There are some people who are doing testing that, fe that have found petroleum-based. I don't think they've tested all oyster beds in Louisiana, though. So it, it, as I said, it really depends on where the tests have been taken and what they found. I mean, oysters are filter feeders. So if you have something in the water, they are going to take it in. How long it would take it to process it may be unknown. Um, you know. But if it wasn't an area that was inundated with oil, the oysters, I mean, you have the same problem, I hate to say this, with fecal coliform a lot. I would implore you that when you see those studies like that, make sure that you look at, at uh, sample sizes and how they were actually sampled and, uh, and how many and what areas from. But do you want, do you want to answer something? went and checked the leases out and um we checked I don't know how many hundreds of acres we passed on and we tested them and I ate off of every lease I could eat I arched off of it I was eating it I never tasted one bad one yet and I don't know what the studies how they check on a study but my study said it was all good Um, I was just wondering, I, this is maybe just one of the big questions still out there, uh, what studies are being done about the dispersants? Well, um, it is my, under, um, my understanding that there are studies that are ongoing. We do not know what the federal studies are mainly because there, a lot of them are related to the National Resource Damage Assessment, which is a legal process, and they're pretty, they're supposed to be putting together a report that that summarizes all studies being done under the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, but we have not gotten them. I did talk to a, well, I was on a phone call with a toxicologist from Maine yesterday who has been doing uh, whale biopsies 
and they have in fact been looking at the chemicals in the dispersant oil mixture and what impact that will have on what they saw as, as whale blubber and cells. Um, and he hasn't had the money actually, he's not fully funded to do all of the testing, but some of their findings are not very good. So they're uh, concerned. But there hasn't been a lot of comprehensive testing. We have gotten release through a Freedom of Information Act request of the cumulative listing of, of um, the components of all dispersant. And we have a toxicologist looking at it right now because some of those, depending on, it depends on dose, it depends on dilution impact. Um, but some of those uh, actual ingredients are or have been found to be uh, toxic at certain levels in mice and you know, so it, it really depends. But those are the only studies I know that are going on. Um, there has been an effort by us, uh, Sierra Club, NRDC, Gulf Restoration Network, and a couple of other groups through the help of Earth Justice Legal Defense Fund. Um, it turns out that EPA, in fact, over the last 20 years has not complied with the Oil Pollution Act and so had not done comprehensive studies they were required to do on dispersant, the, the effect of dispersants at, on different species, different life stages, and different water types. And so they have now agreed that they're going to do it. The question is what the timeline is for those studies. But it's not Lisa Jackson or this administration. I, I try to say that. It's all the past administrations since the Oil Pollution Act was passed. So it's Democrats and Republicans alike have failed to do the studies they needed to do and in fact, when we asked for the ingredients, they found that they had a dispersant listed on the list that they didn't have the ingredients for. They didn't even know what the ingredients were. So I thought that was pretty telling. Uh, so we're still working on it. There's some people up here, man. Oh. Uh, Karen, uh, do you have a good reason for uh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, all papers I read, the uh, New, uh, Times Picayune, Morning Advocate, and even our local papers until recently, not covering any of the human impacts of this, the health issues that, in, that have been involved with this. There has been a paucity, an absolute paucity of information on this, and I can assure you that there have been some gigantic effects. And if I talk to these guys for long enough, they're going to say, oops, I've got some friends that have these problems. Um, well, it's a little hard to speak for all media. <laughs> but, um, but, I mean, I, I think that the Times, I know, is continuing to, to cover this story. And if you have, you know, evidence and something that you'd like to talk to me about, I'm happy to hear it. Again, it's, you know, we, I have colleagues that write about, um, we're right about human health, and, and, and we're always interested in the impact, so. Oh, I had a couple of points of clarity. Um, none of the commercial oyster beds have been impacted by oil, and none of the seafood that's come out of any of our open harvestable waters has shown up to have any levels of concern, contamination in it. Um, as far as the deaths of oysters, because there have been substantial, it was directly, as you said, related to those uh, diversion openings. Um, and so since oysters have a three-year life cycle, it's going to be a while before the oysters that didn't spat and the oysters that were killed by the oil spill are going to be able to recover from the impacts of that. But as far as we've seen, um, we were effective or we had good luck in that the oil did not make it into those beds, which would have had much more devastating long-term effects as far as chronic oiling. Once you get the oil into those sediments, it won't degrade and it stays there. Um, and I think as, uh, in response to the question about uh, dispersion studies, we have a lot of issues. There's huge gaps in our available data right now, and particularly there's a lack of funding for academic research that's ongoing. Um, there's tons of research being done by federal agencies, but as you said, it's being held because of its part of the NRDA process, but there's been a lack of funding. Um, NSF put, gave out a huge amount of funding early on for rapid response, uh, and there's supposed to be money coming forward from BP, but it's been held up in the pipeline for quite some time now. And the RFP that was supposed to be released late last year has only just now reached the academic community, and those funds still haven't been released. Um, so just a couple of points of clarity. Um, Ms. Artu? Um, I'm wondering, um, especially in this group here, uh, Gulf Future, 
Um, and I'm kind of impressed uh, the group, the different groups of people that are involved. Um, I don't see Waterkeeper Alliance, that, that bigger Waterkeeper Alliance, but I know you do work with, GRN does work with them, but um, I don't know, is the Gulf Future Plan um, working to, for, for, our, for true mediation, what is being done to promote systems and technologies that remove the oil and neutralize the oil and remove the corrects it and, and neutralize it as a and and what it, how much is that being done instead of just letting the the same forces come in and spray more dispersant which is not the same as removal or, or neutralization what is, what is GRN and Gulf Future doing to promote removal and we don't, we uh, don't, neutralization we don't promote technologies so if there is a technology available you can, I mean, you can go before the federal government. We are working on things like dispersant um, to try to verify that, in fact, it is being continually sprayed, which I'm hearing it is. Um, we are trying to get the ingredients we are working with in the law. Um, not everybody that works on Gulf Future works on the exact same issues. There are four different subgroups. Um, Waterkeeper Alliance itself has staff that work with the Save the Gulf groups of water keepers. Um, each one of them speaks for themselves and signs on or does not sign on at their own, like all environmental groups. So we work with a lot of groups that aren't signed on. We work with a lot of groups that are signed on. But the biggest problem in terms of technology is that we have had hundreds of people come to us and want us to press for their technology to be applied. We don't have the qualifications. I can try to help people get a congressional effort to look at technologies. During the oil spill, we pushed to try to get the three agencies to look at technologies. But to be honest, I don't know a good technology from a not a good technology. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a bioscientist. I am not, you know, and I had people coming to me telling me hose were good. You should use stockings. You should use hair. You should use biocides. You should use, you know, and I, we had so many technologies come forward that I was dumbfounded, and I knew nothing. I mean, I, I, like I said, I'm an attorney. I am not a scientist. And so the most we could do was to go to Congress and request that they fund an effort to look at technologies and to force the Coast Guard to look at those technologies in the context of different oil spills, because they are of the opinion that what works in Delaware may not work in the Gulf and that the volume available in Delaware may not be available in the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, I'm not technically qualified to argue with them. All I can do is ask Congress to institute a system whereby they can test those technologies and weed them out. And so that's what we've been doing. But, you know, right now, I have to tell you, the Congress is not too friendly to this issue. So trying to get something through Congress is not exactly very easy since the last election. And many people are very golf fatigued in Congress, meaning they think we've gotten too much money, we get too much attention, and they really don't want to do much more for us. And so the momentum is against us, not for us. And people need to understand that. I mean, it's, it's getting tougher and tougher to get anything through that has anything to do with the golf. And that's just the reality. Um, Cynthia, that was a pretty good segue, actually, to my question. Um, and <laughs> thanks to the panelists, photographer, and the family. Um, in light of the the mood right now, the entire congressional delegation for Louisiana is anti any accountability um, for the oil and gas industry, as far as taxes are concerned. And you mentioned a couple of strategies that they could pursue, whether it was backfilling canals. What strategies and what tactics does GRN and your partners um, pursue going forward to try to work with those companies, to try to work with the politicians and other stakeholders to get them to be accountable? Well, I mean, we, we have in the past and we continue to try to meet with some of the oil companies to talk to them about it. Uh, we have partners who actually work with the oil industry, so sometimes, you know, you have your partners who are close to the oil industry and they will talk to them. We are trying to talk to the congressional delegation and some of, like, Garrett Graves at the Coastal Planning and CPRA, I only know the initials. 
Um, anyway, to, to talk about those being sort of your short term, because we've talked to the Ecosystem Restoration Task Force, we've tried to talk to many of these agencies about if you have long term plans for diversions and sediment pumping, you're talking sometimes 10 or 15 years. And you have to have some shorter term strategies in between, and some of them are more cost effective. And they may not create hundreds of thousands of acres of wetlands, but as I said, they'll stop the bleeding as you're sort of trying to develop the surgery or the mechanism to restore the wetland. So I think you have to have several components. And that's one of our arguments is it's pretty cheap. The Park Service did it recently and have been really happy with it. Um, and one of the men who was responsible now works for National Wildlife Federation. Um, and his name is David Muth. And you can talk to them because they've been pretty happy with what happened. And it did not cost them that much money. And they're still navigable in terms of little boats. You know, they're not hugely um, navigable by big boats. But so I think we just need to start looking at different strategies. And we sit down and try to talk to people about things. We sometimes sue them, too. But we will sometimes ask them nicely if they will do things. OK, final question. I have a, I have a quick question. Unless you um, have one back there. Uh, in your section, I always when I hear these things, I want to hear well, what what can we do, or what what would help, or what would do anything. Um, when you talk about um, reduce the construction of new canals, they actually are still digging canals like currently. That's really surprising. Um, I mean, I've known, I mean, prior to BP, I mean, everybody's known about the Swiss cheese effect from the canals. And do they backfill any of the canals ever? They have. Or just not enough? It's very few that I've ever heard. Some of them have been shut, and I don't know how they make that decision. So some of them, actually, they won't backfill them, but they'll put some kind of blockage at one end or the other. Like the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, how they built the. So in spite of their soaring profits, they don't ever have to put anything back in. Because, you know, we all know this infrastructure can't be moved, the oil and gas infrastructure. Like, let's put it somewhere else if Louisiana doesn't want to play ball anymore. I mean, that's not possible. So they just don't have any real regulations that will force any of this. No. And the last thing is, will, will you be swimming in the Gulf on the Florida Panhandle this summer, or would you? I probably, I mean, I probably would. Um, you know, I, my, my opinion is if you're not doing a lot of this stuff every day and you're not, you know, drinking it or whatever, um, and it depends on where you're going. I mean, there are a lot of tar balls out there, and I'm hearing a lot of tar balls. There are a lot of tar balls coming up in Florida. There's a lot of tar balls coming up in, you know, in Grand Isle. There's a lot of tar balls. Um, as far as do I think the water itself is contaminated? I really don't think a lot of it is right at the moment inshore. I think a lot of it is potentially at, at depth offshore. There may be a lot of oil that's out there or oil and dispersant. Um, you know, what I've been being told is the more they spray dispersant, the more bioavailable it is, the more dispersed it is through the oil, I mean, the water. And, and that's part of the problem. Um, so, you know, I guess I would, but some of my, co my colleagues won't. You know, I mean, my whole, my whole philosophy, I hate to say this, is I used to, I was stupid enough as a kid to run through DDT, so I guess, it, you know, whatever, whatever else they're going to do to me is going to, you know. Mosquito spray. Yeah. 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 You know, we used to run through it when we were kids. Um, would I put a little kid in it? I'm not sure. You know, I, and I know a lot of, there's a lot of difference of opinion. Would I put my, my child in it? I might not. So... Very difficult question to answer. You want to take one more, Justin? He's already committed. <laughs> one last. We're going to go. We're both going to go. <laughs> <laughs> My question too. is for Aaron and the Grecos. Um, I was just curious how seeing yourself in the video and the photos and the story affected you and what you thought of your son after you saw his boat and how happy he was and everything. <laughs> and then my question. Oh. He's, he's still a pain. <laughs> he's very difficult to work with. <laughs> Glad he got his own boat. <laughs> he's just grumpy. <laughs> this, this is not a show. This is all day long, believe me. No, I'm, I'm glad to see him have his own boat. I like to see him on side of me out there. What about the crab population? Yeah, they, they're doing really good right now with the crabs. 
Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah, well, at the island, we catching crabs, you know. Got a lot of young ones, but um, they, they there. We didn't get impact. Yeah, we didn't get impact. Even Black Bay. I mean, I was out there skimming just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago anyway, and I seen a lot of young shrimp. And, and yeah, well, just a few brownies, but a lot of white ones, you know. Our white shrimp are so big right now, I've never ever seen them this big. Uh, I don't know. We've got plenty of young ones inside, too. Mm -hmm. um, my question, I would like everyone to answer, including you, Dr. Bob. Um, our government is increasingly solving our problems through privatization. What do you think about privatizing the wetland and the Gulf Coast recovery effort? Why is it not being done? Congress isn't cooperating. There's support out there. And there would be more with more education. Like, how can we move forward in doing this ourselves? because our government is not behind us. Sam, you want to start? Privatization. You know, it, I am really torn on this privatization issue because um, I find it interesting, and this is really my philosophy, I won't say this is my organization's philosophy, that I hear more and more that we don't like big government. But every time we turn around and have a disaster, we want the federal government to come in and save us. And the question is, really nobody can do it better in some ways and less expensively unless you want to do something like, which nobody, a lot of people wouldn't trust, I mean, the, the, it would be to try to empower private entities to do it, but then you get into a cost-benefit issue for them. In many states, they privatize prisons. And what they found is the treatment of prisoners decreased and the cost of keeping those prisoners increased. So in the short term, it seems like a positive thing. In the long term, sometimes the public loses. And so for me, I just don't think you can do disaster response in a private way unless you force. Like in Alaska, they did it with the oil industry, but they forced the oil industry to pay for it. Oh. I, you know, I'm not, I'm torn on that one too. There's a, a lot of political issues on this, on this whole thing. I don't know. I just don't know who can really move that much. Because there are, in coastal restoration, there's a lot of condemnation. You're going to end up having to take people's land. And you are going to have to take their industry. And you are having, going to have to take, I mean, there are just a lot of shifts that are going to happen. And I'm not sure that a private corporation could do it. I think they don't have the legal authority to do it. Uh, there's already legal issues we're having in terms of land management and land ownership and whether you can actually make changes necessary to build land on certain people's property. I mean, I know Mark Davis is studying that and has been studying that for three years and they can't get around the land. Even in, even in um, the central wetlands, they're having trouble figuring out who owns the land and who you have to gain title from and who, how you can do it. And I, I'm just, you know, I think sometimes it just takes government authority to be able to do something and make the difficult decisions. I don't know. I'm not a great privatizer. Virginia? Well, well they mineral have to be rights. Paid by somebody. Virginia? I shouldn't be the well, only one answering well, this question. They should have to answer this question, too. Most of coastal Louisiana is privately owned. Okay. Landowners are very. Land is precious to them, just like land is precious to anyone who owns a house and the lot you live on. And so the Louisiana Landowners Association, and uh, they've hired biologists, and they're tr uh, many of the landowners are very aggressively, particularly in southwest Louisiana, where you've got large landowners that have huge tracts. And you know the rate of land loss over there, for geologic reasons, but also because they take good care of their land, the rate of land loss is a lot lower over there. But, um, you know, the, the thing about privatization, 
when I was uh, just working in coast in Louisiana and on these issues for so many years, for three decades, you know, the benefits of restoring a wetland aren't gained by the people that own them always. The shrimp come in on the tides as little larvae. They stay in the wetlands and then they mature and they go out on the tide. So the landowner that restores the marsh does not get those shrimp. And so, you know, while the, the, you know, it makes sense for the private folks, you know, if they've leased the land for duck hunting, now they get a, a return for that directly, a check. But the benefits of maintaining the coast are for people who live in the city. They don't own an inch of land, okay? And so that's a little of a bit of a quandary here in Louisiana because the landowner, the private sector, does not get the benefits that everybody else, so the benefits are for, are for, for the public, as well as the private landowner who might get a duck lease or put up some butterfly nets on one of their canals or something like that. So there are maybe some income, but generally speaking, the value of our coast is shared amongst all the people that live here. And most of the people do not own the land. So it's, it's, so it's a complicated legal sort of and financial sort of situation. Yeah, and if you're an owner, uh, your values come out of mineral rights. They don't come out of surface rights. I mean, when you talked about a check for duck mm -hmm. hunting, that's minimal. Uh, so, you know, the fact that you have mineral rights, uh, uh, what, what uh, was referred to with one of Mark's projects, the coalition's been working on this for 15 years, and we're getting closer every day, but uh, there's a, a concept of having a Louisiana wetland trust uh, in this state where property owners, and 90% of coastal Louisiana, last time I looked, uh, is privately owned, whether it's a family conglomerate uh, or uh, 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 ConocoPhillips, used to be LL&E, and, and groups like that. But to put together this Louisiana Wetland Trust, the concept is, is that, they, that those companies and private entities can donate the surface rights, the surface management rights of their land to a public trust and retain their mineral rights so that they're, they're, what they really want the land for is still there. And then the trust fund would be set up in a way that it would manage as one big unit of land, if you will, uh, the management of that area. What's happening now is that this person manages theirs to maintain it, this person manages theirs, this person manages theirs, and sometimes those are working against one another. So I think you're gonna see that happen in the next decade, and that'll probably be the resolution to your question. But you just can't have the private sector do it. They've always owned it and look at it because they don't care about the surface. They care about what's underneath. So we would like to thank our speakers. Thank you very much. <laughs>